coming from. And a lot of it is actually based on the hoteling model. So you did do that recently? Okay. So then we, maybe we don't need to do a whole lot. So there's an example of a hoteling model with a backstop resource. So say you have a fossil energy resource and then you also have some alternative energy um, that you can turn to at some point. And we call it a backstop because we're assuming that um, it can be scaled up at constant marginal cost. You can have as much of it as you want. Um, okay, so in this example, you know, we have a backstop up here, it costs a little under $50. And so, but, you know, if we have, say, a um, low cost fossil energy resource that only costs $20, say this is like a barrel of oil equivalent, for example, uh, we want to extract that and consume that first. It's cheaper. Okay? And so, um, what do you have then in, in your equilibrium? Well, okay, we know from the hoteling problem. Okay, so we have a producer. Let's assume this is a price-taking producer. Uh, has a stock of oil. So it can't extract over time more barrels of oil than it actually has in its stock. That's a stock constraint, right? Um, and so it wants to, but it wants to maximize its profits because this is oil in the ground. It can decide whether to extract it now and sell it now, take the money, invest it at interest rate R, or it can leave it in the ground and wait until later. And so it's this decision on the timing of when to extract the resource um, uh, that drives this model. So maximizing profits, so profits are whatever price it gets at time t for the quantity it produces at time t minus the extraction cost. And all of this gets discounted back to the present. So what does that mean? You take the first order condition, this is subject to the constraint that over time you can't extract more than you actually have in your stock your physical stock, you get this first order condition that your net profit, so the price minus the extraction cost, equals the shadow value of this resource. Um, and so what we get is, you know, discounted, the discounted sh um, uh, marginal profit equals this constant shadow value. Or, conversely, your marginal profit is going to be increasing over time at the rate of interest, because that's the opportunity cost of your capital, okay? So going back to the picture then, we have a price, an equilibrium price path, and so that price is going to rise um, at a rate that keeps the marginal profit, uh, um, discounted marginal profit constant, um, and then you have uh, that the total demand at this price over time um, has to equal your cumulative uh, stock. And then the backstop comes in because, you know, you know consumers are going to consume whatever is cheaper. So the price of this resource can't rise above the backstop or they're just switched to the backstop sooner and then you won't have extracted everything in your stock. Okay, so that means that, you know, at the last point in time, we'll call this XB when you switch over to the backstop, these two prices have to be the same. Okay, so that um, equation gives you, um, is going to help you pin down uh, what your rent is. Yeah, what's, yeah. This is, uh, for, this is from the firm's perspective. It's the relative, you know, it's, it's relative, it's relevant discount rate is the interest rate. It's whatever, it's the opportunity cost of capital. It can invest it and make money on it. So we're assuming that's the same thing in this, in this. We're not making a distinction between a social discount rate and an interest rate. Yeah. 
it's the you know the rele whatever's relevant for the objective of the of of the person. In this case, this if this is a, a resource owner, it's relevant. Uh, um, discount rate is the interest rate. It's the same thing in this case. You could think of a planner problem where you uh, might want to make a distinction, but. Maybe this is the danger of doing this after you've been thinking about discounting and all the complexities of discounting for an hour and a half. But um, uh, yeah, so we're not going to make a distinction here. And so you have these e an equilibrium, you know, that um, the price has to follow this path and the pr consumer price will be the minimum of whatever that fossil producer price is and the backstop you have the stock constraint, so this is the cumulative extraction at that price is equal to the stock, and then we know at this switchover point, the price of the fossil resource is just going to equal the cost of the backstop. So that this that helps us pin down that shadow value and x, x b, the switchover time. Now, what happens if we lower the cost of the backstop? <coughs> Okay, so now suppose we've done some innovation and we've come up with a, a new biofuel that's cheaper. Okay, it's still more expensive than fossil fuels right now, but it, it's cheaper. It's going to be cheaper. So what happens? So that switchover point, that switchover equation, we know that the uh, price then of fossil fuels at that last date of extraction is going to equal this new lower backstop cost. So that means a couple things. Um, one is that, you know, so that's got to be lower. So then the whole price path has to be lower. Okay, because we have this relationship between the marginal profit rising over time um, at the, let's call it the discount rate now. Um, so that means uh, you know, the rents are going to fall and the, pri the whole price path will be lower because otherwise if the price stayed the same, we'd switch, where's that big stick? Yeah, okay. You know, if the price path didn't change, then we'd switch over here once the, once it, you know, the backstop is cheaper. But then at this price path, we wouldn't have exhausted the resource completely. So what happens then, then that, that stock constraint wouldn't be binding. Lamp, that, that means lambda is zero. Well, it's not zero, it's positive, but it can't be as high as it was before. So the rent falls, the whole price path falls, and then we're still um, exhausting the resource completely. As long as there's positive rent, you're exhausting the resource completely, but you're doing it faster. You're switching over to the backstop sooner and exhausting the resource faster. It is anticipated. Okay. But it's just the intuition. You know, looking ahead, they know, okay, we're going to have some competition in the future. We're not going to be able to sell for as high a price. Um, so we might as well just sell more now. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, because it's this, it's this backstop cost that's pinning down what the final price is, and then you work it out all backwards, okay? So then in order to exhaust the resource um, with this path, uh, you know, the price is going to be lower, so quantity demanded at a lower price is higher than at the higher price. So you have more demand. So you're, this is the price path we're looking at. The extraction path is going gonna, is gonna to be shifting up. Because at lower prices, consumers demand more. So your consumption increases is higher when this price path is lower, and you exhaust the resource faster. Yeah. Well, this backstop is already available. It, in, by assumption, is available, or it's it's avail it's available any time. You know, before here, it's just this is the this is the cost. It can be available right now. It's just expensive. I mean, cellulosic ethanol is available right now. It's just really friggin' expensive. So you know, we're not going to be using it. So so this is the you know you want to uh, use the resource that's relatively cheaper now, and uh, and then switch to 
the alternative technology. Notice we don't have a carbon price in here. We're not talking about emissions values in here, but this is how the, you know, the market would respond to a competing technology in the hoteling model. Yeah. Okay, well think of this as, you know, this is starting at this point and, you know, this is the information that you're getting now. Yeah, you know, extract along, okay, say in 10 years from now, oh, now we have new information, some guy came up with a really great idea and the cost of the backstop is lower or it's looking a lot harder to get it than we expected, the cost is higher. You update your information and then it's like you're starting back um, you know, then today is time zero again. Of course, you've been, you've exploited some of your stock, so your stock constraint is, is a little different too, but this is how you'll respond to that new information. If the uh, competing technology costs is lower, then that lowers the value of your asset because, you know, you're not, not credibly going to be able to sell it as the highest price for as long, and so then if you want to make the most of out, out of it, you, you know, extract it while you can. Now if the, um, ultimately if the price of the backstop comes down to, you know, the price of the, uh, the resource, then, you know, you don't have rent, so you may not extract all of it. But otherwise, as long as it's, you know, the cost of the backstop is higher than the, the pure extraction cost of the resource, you're going to have some positive rents and um, you know, you'll exploit it. Yeah. There, I mean, you know, there's, there's a, I just wanted to give you a little overview of the, of the simple model here that's underlying some of the green paradox uh, models. There are, you can raise a million, there, I mean, there are a million variations that have, that have been done and, um, and that are interesting, involving uncertainty and, um, multiple pools, we'll get into uh, some other things, but I just wanted to make sure you have the intuition of what's going on with this model, because this is what underlines the green paradox. Um, so we saw in this simple model, so if you're assuming 100%, you know, that you're going to exhaust your resource, uh, what does that mean for emissions over time? Yeah. You always have the same, if you always have, cum, you know, uh, exhaustion, you always have the same cumulative emissions over time. So this is a very depressing kind of strand of the literature. <laughs> because not only does, like, policies that you put on, uh, do they not affect cumulative emissions, but, you know, technology policy looks really bad because the one thing that it does is it accelerates emissions. Okay, so, so this is uh, what's called the green paradox. So just the acceleration of extraction emissions we'll call the weak green paradox. And then, but you know, the point is, as we, you know, you're thinking about the discounting that you just had, um, that accelerating emissions can actually, in theory, raise the present discounted value of damages and so make you worse off in a present value sense, in theory. Okay, so this is the strong green paradox, and um, so these are but these are the things that Steve and I sort of pick away at. Okay, because <laughs> um, you know if you look at the IPCC and the way uh, the scientists think about it, um, if we want to try to make a goal like uh, keeping warming at two degrees C, something like that. We've only, we've got a finite carbon budget, okay? And in fact, so the, the latest report indicates that we have um, maybe 30 years, if we continue at current, you know, energy consumption and emissions rates, we will blow this budget in 30 years. Um, on the other hand, you have, uh, this is in, the, I put this in because I saw this on Greenwire today. ExxonMobil, it, uh, you know, just released a new report uh, assessing, 
you know, climate policy risks, and it basically believes that, you know, it's possible that climate policy would come in there, but it's highly unlikely to keep its oil and gas reserves from selling in the next three decades. So Exxon doesn't believe that they really have to change their mode of operation. They're going to, you know, continue that. Maybe they'll shift the rents down a little, we don't know, but it's, it sounds like they plan to exhaust. Okay, so that gets us to my paper with Steve, Limits to Limiting Greenhouse Gases. Um, so that's the problem, that we have this limited carbon budget, but in actuality our reserves of fossil fuels far outweigh the carbon budget. So this is I want, this is what I want help updating from certain IPCC authors with new data. So this is from the last, uh, the last iteration. But so at that point in time, there was this, they had sort of a low and a high estimate of our carbon budget. That's the black line here. And these are estimates of the reserves of carbon in the ground. Okay? And no, they're much larger than the carbon budget. In fact, you know, in, um, in these scenarios, so like the high, the high scenario, oil alone, much less gas and coal, oil alone can blow the budget. So obviously we're going to, you know, if we, if we want to try to meet our carbon climate goals, um, there's no way that we can exhaust all these fossil fuel resources. Now, Steve and I are going to focus on oil because, you know, arguably that's the sector with the highest scarcity rents and opportunities for, you know, adjusting behavior over time. I don't think people really think coal is that scarce. So if we make it expensive enough. Yeah. Um, the black one. So this is the carbon budget. This was the remaining carbon budget at this time, which I think, you know, like, t so they, they calculated in 2007. So what they're saying now is the scientists say that our total carbon budget is about, and they didn't seem to have, they didn't do the Serenaris the same in the new report, but our total carbon budget, they're estimating at about um, uh, 1,000 gigatons since the Industrial Revolution. And we've already eaten up over half of that, a little over half of that. Okay, so it's, it, um, so it's changed a little bit, but it's, it, I mean, the picture will be similar to this. But I would like new data. Yes? That's the budget for two degrees C. Yeah. I mean, they obviously lay out, they're more of a range, in the, but that's sort of the central estimate. Okay. Now, what's the other problem? So that's a problem. We're going to have to figure out how to leave this stuff in the ground. The other problem is that we have this international regime where, um, you know, only a share of global energy demand is regulated. So we have common but differentiated responsibilities. But we, you know, we just have, you know, say what you're going to do right now kind of climate policy. And um, so there is not a global price on carbon. There is not a coordinated approach. You have a situation in which you have some regions that are regulating carbon, taxing uh, fossil fuels highly, and others that that don't. So. Um, this is a problem because you're dividing demand up into uh, two parts of the world. So um, there, I th think carbon leakage can have a couple different dimensions. One is the um, space dimension that um, I've also spent a lot of time thinking about. So this is the idea that uh, your climate policy in one region, the actions that you take to reduce your own emissions, uh, your own energy demand, what does that do? You're withdrawing demand from uh, the global market for energy, so the price response is prices go down, it's cheaper for other folks, non-regulating countries to consume energy, they actually consume more because it's cheaper. So um, uh, there are also effects in terms of manufacturing competitiveness and traded goods. And so there's been a lot of work on like how big the spatial leakage is using um, you know trade models, global trade models, and the estimates range from about five to thirty percent. Um, so um, 
But we're also uh, then worried about, you can think about having carbon leakage over time. So this is sort of a way of rephrasing the green paradox idea um, in that um, the reductions that you, you think you would get if there weren't this response in terms of lowering the rents on oil, the shadow value of fossil fuels, um, you know, you think you get a certain amount of emissions reductions, but that part of that is going to get undone because the fossil resource owners can respond um, uh, by lowering their scarcity rents and, um, and selling more today. Okay, so just a quick, um, you know, overview of the green paradox literature. So you had sort of a first generation of models where the assumptions were basically that you always exhaust. So you can't do anything about cumulative emissions and then the only thing they can look at then is the timing of emissions. So you can use, um, you know, different paths of your emissions tax in order to slow down emissions and hope that the climate has some observative capacity. I, I'm not a big fan of that because it, does, it just doesn't seem to jibe well with what the scientists are, are saying in terms of how irreversible climate damage is and this idea of just having a carbon budget and th that, that, you know, I, I'm not convinced how much the timing matters um, within, you know, the next few decades. Um, so then there's a second generation of models that make assumptions that do allow for cumulative emissions reductions. Um, and they can also focus on backstop cost structures and substitutability among, um, among that. And, and that's one way of, of getting a little less uh, green paradox result. Um, so Steve and I have a first paper that sort of falls in that category. And then there's a third generation of models that combine the spatial and intertemporal leakage. Um, so where you assume that there are parts of the world that are unregulated or less regulated have different uh, carbon prices, say. Um, but in this, and uh, in, in these papers, then you go back to the case where um, you have exhaustion unless, um, you know, there's some way that you can retire the stocks. So Michael Hole has a really nice paper. I'll, I'll, actually, I think that's the next slide. No, okay, no. Um, Michael has, uh, Michael Hole has a nice paper looking at um, this sort of combination of spatial uh, and intertemporal leakage. Um, and then, but, and Bart Harstadt uh, also has an interesting paper of looking at the, the supply side of climate policy. So basically where he argues that what we really need to do, because of this, this effect of fossil resource owners being able to adjust to demand side policies, what you really want to do is just retire stocks and make sure they stay in the ground. And then what does that do for leakage? Well, that's great because that bids up the scarcity value, that bids up energy prices. And so everybody, including the unregulated guys, consume less and consume slower. Um, so that's a really cute paper. Of course, uh, you know, are we really going to convince Russia to just decide to leave massive amounts on the ground? I don't think so. so. Okay, so, so uh, Steve and I are sort of slotting ourselves in this third generation of models. And the uh, one difference that we have here is we, we sort of think of technical change in the backstop as an ongoing process. So you have costs declining over time. And, and what's nice, in this case, at some point, you know, you can think of innovating enough so that the backstop will actually become cheaper than just the production cost of the fossil resource right now, okay? So, so what that does is that, you know, opens up the possibility of having cumulative emissions reductions and wanting to leave some of the stuff in the ground. Um, remember, so in Hull's paper, um, he assumed that um, 
you know, you have constant backs up costs, like the simple example I gave at the beginning. And so in that case, you always have complete exhaustion as long as any one consumer <laughs> is left untaxed. Because eventually they can always, uh, it, they will always find the fossil resource cheaper and will just consume that until it's all gone. Um, so we're thinking then of also technical, uh, uh, technology policy where we can affect this rate of um, technological improvement, cost improvement. Um, so we're going to assume that alpha percent of world demand is uh, regulated. Um, so again, we're focusing on the demand side and not the supply side. And then the remaining share is unregulated. Um, and we have a tax rate that's tau and it's going to rise at the rate of interest. You can also think of this as maybe the price of bankable emissions of permits, which you would expect to rise over time at the rate of interest. Um, as basically, and that's basically an optimal tax path if you think you have just this carbon budget constraint and not um, other decay effects or something. Um, and then the other thing we do, so we uh, allow, we have multiple resource pools that have different costs. So, um, um, and also different emissions factors. And that's going to make uh, some differences in our model. So we can think of this as sort of being motivated by the different uh, types of oil resources we have. So this is from the IEA. Um, and we're going to use this to make a stylized model. But you see, okay, we're, we've got Middle East and North African conventional oil. That's the cheapest to get out of the ground. We've got other conventional oil, a little more expensive, enhanced oil recovery, deep water. And then we get into, this is the oil sands, um, or tar sands if you don't like them, um, heavy oil, bitumen, and then oil shale. Shale oil is, you know, with the stuff that you get, I guess, through fracking, like shale gas. Um, and then, we're basically going to assume we're never, we're not going to get to the point where we want to use coal to liquids, which is even more emitting. Um, and then we have an alternative uh, fuel backstop. Um, and uh, conveniently, the emissions rates of these different uh, types of oil go up with the cost. So we don't have to worry about any cost inversion as we're pricing, um, pricing carbon. Okay, so did you uh, learn the Herfindahl model in your resources class? So this is a classic paper by Herfindahl. So when you have multiple resources with different costs, then you always want to access the lowest cost pools first. And then so you go and seek was from low to high cost pools. Um, uh, then, uh, and the cost of pools, so there are a couple different ways where you might uh, think about the cost differing between pairs of pools and pairs of consumers. So in our case, you know, we have regulatory jurisdiction, so consumers in, um, in countries with a carbon tax are going to have face different costs of those resource pools than consumers who aren't subject to a carbon tax. But there are other um, other things. So uh, Chakravorty et al. have um, a paper using different energy conversion and emissions factors and also substitution effects across different types of fuels. And then uh, Steve and Gerard Godet, Michel Moreau uh, have a nice paper on transportation costs where. Um, uh, you can have different pairs. So what this means is that um, sort of the combination of this literature, so actually um, Gerard and Steve have a nice overview paper. So no, no, one, any, no user is going to switch from a high cost source to a low cost source. They, they always go from a low cost source to a high, higher co cost source. But you have some users that may switch from low to high at different times because their relative costs are different. 
um, or at different dates, or they might even skip over one of the resources and go to the backstop directly. Um, so we'll see this in our model. We start out with a like a two pool theory model just to get the intuition down, and then and then we use that IEA information and others to calibrate um, an oil market model um, and examine our different policies. Um, so we saw for the competitive equilibrium for any combination of policies, so carbon tax, and coalitions carbon tax, size of coalition, and the rate of technological change. And then you know, we look at how these policies affect different outcomes. Okay. Um, so the interest, there are two types of equilibrium that you can have in this model. So, so our, um, you know, resource pool, since we kind of, we're going to have like a step cost function, so constant marginal cost within each pool, but then the next pool is going to have a higher constant marginal pot, uh, cost. So you get these kind of, kind of kinks, and you get two potential equilibria of um, interest. So one is that uh, every pool that is used at all um, is fully exhausted. So uh, we won't focus on this right now um, because you know as long as the highest uh, cost pool utilized has, posi has positive rent, the only thing your policies are going to do, and they're not going to reduce cumulative emissions, they're going to reduce that shadow value. But you know, make them more and more stringent, and eventually you'll get to the point where you're at this other equilibrium, where the highest cost pool um, that's being utilized has zero rent. You basically uh, get rid of the rents in the last pool, and then only a fraction of it is depleted. And so in that case, you know, making your policy combination more stringent, you'll actually get some cumulative emissions reductions. That's, that's the more interesting part. And, and so we'll focus on that in the theory part. Nah, we can We don't need to do all that. Okay, it's pictures. So, um, so this is what it. it um, uh, this is again the price path. Okay, but now our backstop, instead of being constant, is declining over time. Okay, and so now we have regulated and unregulated consumers. So let's start with the unregulated consumer. Um, uh, so the unregulated consumer starts out consuming the low cost pool, so we know that it has a positive rent and so and that cost is going to rise over, price is going to rise over time until it meets uh, the production cost of the high cost pool. Okay, and the reason that this stays flat, so the price, the high cost pool is going to stay at the marginal cost of extraction because it doesn't have any rents. Because by the time, you know, that price gets hits the backstop price, at this point in time, cumulative consumption is less, you know, of this pool is less than the stock. So that stock constraint is no longer binding. Okay, so it's just flat, shadow value of zero. In the regulated region now, so they also start with the low cost pool and then, um, and then they switch over to the high cost pool as well, but they uh, switch sooner to the backstop. So this is in the case that they have equal emissions factors for the, between the low and the high cost pools. And we know this is going up because the tax is going up over time. Okay. I think we got that. Okay, yeah, what I said. Is there a, there's another clicker, isn't there? I can't be in two places at once. Um, now, if the tax is high enough, um, the policy is stringent enough, then you can actually get to the point where the regulated guys go straight from the low cost pool to the backstop without consuming any of the um, high cost pool. But the unregulated guys still consume it. Uh, 